At 4.47 a.m. on October 12th, a radar operator aboard the USS George Washington watched his screen light up with six Venezuelan warships forming a deliberate blockade across international waters. His hand hovered over the combat alert as the impossible scenario unfolded. Someone in Caracas had just ordered their navy to confront a nuclear-powered supercarrier battle group carrying more firepower than Venezuela's entire military combined. What happened in the next 90 seconds would expose the catastrophic miscalculation that nearly cost Venezuelan sailors their lives. And if you want to understand why this confrontation was over before it even began, hit that subscribe button right now, because the technological gap between these two forces is more terrifying than you can imagine. Venezuela's Precision Attack Formation The Venezuelan Navy deployed their vessels in what's called a wolf pack configuration, a Soviet-era tactical doctrine specifically designed to overwhelm larger warships through coordinated saturation attacks. The Almirante Brian frigate positioned itself at bearing 045 degrees, exactly 8.2 nautical miles from the carrier's projected path, while four Guaycari-class patrol boats created a crescent formation with 1.8-mile intervals between each vessel. Two Constitution-class fast attack craft held the outer flanks at 12 nautical miles, creating a 28-mile wide interdiction zone that forced the carrier group into a tactical decision point. What made this formation particularly aggressive wasn't just the positioning, it was that Venezuelan fire control systems had switched from search mode to tracking mode, a technical escalation that American combat systems interpret as hostile intent and the response protocol this triggered would reveal capabilities the Venezuelan commanders never anticipated existed. The Aegis system awakens. The moment those Venezuelan radars switched to tracking mode, the USS Gettysburg's AN-SPY 1D radar system detected the frequency change in 0.3 seconds and automatically elevated the threat condition from yellow to red. The Aegis combat system simultaneously classified all six Venezuelan vessels, calculated their maximum weapons range based on known capabilities, plotted optimal intercept trajectories for 24 separate engagement scenarios, and distributed this information across every American platform within 340 nautical miles, all before the Venezuelan radar operators even confirmed their locks. The system identified that the Almirante Brian carried Italian-made Automat MK-2 anti-ship missiles with a maximum range of 100 miles, but also calculated that Venezuela's fire control systems required 82 seconds of continuous radar illumination for a successful launch compared to the 4.7 seconds the Aegis system needed to launch and guide an SM-2 interceptor. The carrier's air wing had already scrambled four FA-18 Super Hornets, carrying AGM-88 Harm missiles specifically designed to home in on active radar emissions, positioning them at 45,000 feet and 85 miles out, close enough to strike within 90 seconds, but far enough that Venezuelan radar couldn't detect them through the ground clutter of their own coastline. Venezuela's communication collapse. American EA-18 G Growlers had been monitoring Venezuelan naval frequencies for the previous six days and identified a critical vulnerability. Every ship in their formation was using the same encrypted UHF channel with 1970s-era frequency-hopping algorithms that modern American systems had cracked decades ago. The National Security Agency database contained the exact encryption key sets sold to Venezuela by a French defense contractor in 1989, and the carrier group's signals intelligence team was reading Venezuelan transmissions in real time with zero decryption delay. At 4.52 a.m., they intercepted a frantic message from the Almirante Brian's captain to Caracas Naval Command, reporting that his fire control radar was experiencing anomalous interference patterns. What he was actually experiencing was the Growler's AN-ALQ-99 jamming pods feeding false target data into his radar returns, making the carrier appear to be in three different locations simultaneously. Caracas responded with an order to maintain formation and stand by for further instructions. 
but that message took four minutes to relay through their shore-based command structure, while American tactical decisions were being executed in under 15 seconds through automated combat systems. The underwater ambush revealed. The USS Helena, a Los Angeles-class attack submarine, had been tracking the Venezuelan fleet for 96 consecutive hours from an average depth of 425 feet, maintaining a trailing position exactly 3,200 yards behind the Almirante Brian, close enough to hear their hull-mounted sonar pings, but positioned in the acoustic shadow zone where Venezuelan equipment couldn't detect return signatures. American submarine doctrine calls this trail and tail positioning and the Helena's sonar operators had collected so much acoustic data on each Venezuelan vessel that they could identify individual ships by the unique sound signature of their propeller blade patterns. At 4.49 a.m., the Helena's fire control system had active solutions on all six Venezuelan vessels, with Mark 48 ADCAP torpedoes already flooded into tubes one through four requiring only a five-second launch sequence to put weapons in the water. The torpedoes would run at 55 knots in passive acoustic mode for the first 2,000 yards before going active for terminal homing, giving Venezuelan ships approximately 3 minutes and 20 seconds from launch to impact. But their anti-submarine warfare capabilities required at least 8 minutes to detect, classify, and deploy countermeasures against incoming torpedoes the second submarine's perfect geometry. While the Helena maintained its trailing position, the USS Alexandria had established a stationary patrol station 18 nautical miles ahead of the carrier group, directly in the path the Venezuelan ships would need to follow if they attempted to close the distance. This positioning created what submarine tacticians call a hammer and anvil formation. If the Venezuelan fleet moved forward to press their blockade, they'd sail directly over the Alexandria's position, and if they retreated, the Helena would maintain pursuit from behind. The Alexandria's captain had positioned his boat at 380 feet depth in a thermocline layer where water temperature differences bent sonar waves, creating an acoustic blind spot that made the submarine virtually invisible to surface detection. American submarine commanders had wargamed this exact scenario 17 times during the previous year's Pacific Fleet exercises, and the tactical doctrine was explicit. Create overlapping fields of fire where no enemy vessel could maneuver without entering at least two separate engagement zones, the sonar pulse that ended it. At precisely 4.56 a.m., both American submarines activated their AN-BQQ-10 sonar system simultaneously, sending powerful, low-frequency pulses that struck every Venezuelan vessel with enough acoustic energy that crews physically felt the vibration through their hull plating. The sonar display aboard the Almirante Brian suddenly showed two submarine contacts, one directly behind them at 3,200 yards and another dead ahead at 15,400 yards. Positions that meant Venezuelan ships were bracketed with no escape route that didn't sail directly over an American attack submarine. The captain immediately recognized the tactical implications. His ships were moving at 12 knots in formation, while American submarines could sprint at 25 plus knots submerged, meaning any attempt to evade would fail, and his 1970s era anti-submarine rockets had a maximum effective range of 1,200 yards against targets he couldn't reliably detect beyond 4,000 yards. Venezuelan naval doctrine, inherited from Soviet training, explicitly states that surface vessels caught between two submerged contacts with no air support should immediately withdraw to shallow coastal waters where submarines cannot follow. The Venezuelan fleet returned to port that morning, having learned the hard way that modern naval warfare isn't decided by courage, it's decided by technology, training, and intelligence dominance that takes decades to build. Their captains made the only rational choice when confronted with mathematics that no amount of bravery could overcome. If this tactical breakdown showed you how real naval confrontations actually unfold, smash that subscribe button and hit the notification bell for more military analysis that goes beyond the headlines. Drop a comment below. Was Venezuela's blockade attempt a political message worth sending? 
or did it just expose dangerous gaps in their naval capabilities? 